It's my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all those who are present today on the occasion of uh, a public lecture by one of our senior fellows, Dr. Mohsin Ali, on the subject of incorporation of Sanskrit texts in the Persianate world from El Baruni to Dara Shiko. Dr. Mohsin Ali is currently a senior fellow at the Prime Minister's Museum and Library and he is working here on the subject Dara Shiko and his comparative hermeneutics of Islam and Hinduism. He teaches at the Department of Persian Language and Literature, Faculty of Humanities and Languages, Jamia Milia, Islamia. He specializes in the Persianate world studies through literature, cultural and historical perspectives. So I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Mohsin Ali. Incorporation of Sanskrit texts in the Persian world was one of the most important phenomena of, say, the period from about 1000 AD, from the time of Mahmud Ghaznavi uh, to about uh, the 18th century. We can divide uh, the interaction of the Sanskrit world with the Islamic world into uh, two broad phases. The first is the pre-Persian phase, that is uh, from about uh, 7th century to the end of the 10th century, that is the time of Mahmud Ghaznavi, when Arabic continues to be the, the main language of the Muslim world. And during this period, a lot of Sanskrit texts were translated, especially during the, the rule of the early Abbasid caliphs in the 8th and 9th century. But these translations and the incorporation of the texts happened from Sanskrit into Arabic. Now some of those texts may have been later, 300, 400 years later, translated into Persian also, but they were translated into Arabic originally. Now, from the time of uh, Mahmud Ghaznavi, with the, with the writing of uh, Firdausi's Shah Nama, now Persian language, after a gap of about three years, 300 years after the Islamic conquest, makes a remarkable comeback. So we see that in what was described as Ajam, that is Persia, what is today's Pakistan, North India and Central Asia, the Persianate world, from around this time, we see a movement towards linguistic and cultural hegemony of the Persian world in some sense, in this geographical area from this time onward. And then we see that the interaction with Sanskrit works is now through the medium of uh, Persian language and a lot of these uh, texts, the Sanskrit texts are incorporated into the Persianate world. Now we know that Sanskrit has uh, an incomparable sort of both uh, quality and quantity of works written in the ancient period and up to the 19th century on virtually every subject under the sun. But four main subjects related to science, astronomy, medicine, metallurgy, mathematics, they were the most important works which were translated, then the works on philosophy, yoga, they again were very important and some, of course, the, the Mahakavyas like Ramayana, Mahabharata and Yoga Vashist, etc., they too were translated. So in a way, the essence of the, uh, the, essence of the Sanskrit world through its texts was incorporated into the Islamic world uh, during this period from about 1000 AD till about the 18th century and that is going to be the focus of uh, Dr. Mohsin Ali's uh, uh, talk today. Now uh, one thing that I would like to mention here is that this incorporation again happens. So it starts from uh, in a major way from Al Baruni. Al Baruni represents a kind of watershed because he comes from the Arab world. But during the Sultanate period, we see we have figures like Amir Khosro, who of course, you know, are interested in Sanskrit, though they haven't learned Sanskrit that way. And then during the Mughal period, it actually reaches its acme. And during the Mughal period, we find that Akbar 
establishes a very large translation department and a large number of Sanskrit works are actually tra translated uh, into Persian. And then of course, uh, with the coming of Dara Shiko, we see a different kind of effort uh, here. So with these uh, few words, I would uh, once again welcome everyone and request Dr. Mohsin Ali to proceed with his lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. It's my pleasure to uh, be a part, uh, to deliver the lecture on this topic, incorporation of Sanskrit text into the Persianate world from Alburuni to Darashiko. Basically, I have divided uh, my lecture into four parts. First is this, uh, I'll talk about a little bit early before the uh, Sultanate period, that the Muslim contact with the other world during uh, Caliph's reign. The another one is Indian Muslim cultural contact during the Delhi Sultanate. And the major focus will be contribution of Mughals. And uh, later on, uh, my topic of the research that is Dara Shiko. So these were the uh, subsection sections of my presentation. So I'll start with the Muslim contact with the world, contribution of Caliphs. Muslim interest in India, particularly in Indian sciences like astronomy, medicine, mathematics, metallurgy, etc., was an important historical phenomenon tracing back to as early as the first half of the 8th century AD. The meteoric rise of Islam beyond the Arabian Peninsula into Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Persia within a decade of the death of Prophet Muhammad in 632 AD brought the Arabs into contact with some of the most ancient civilizations of the world. The Arab warrior conquered new lands. The Arab administrator incorporated them into Darul Islam. And in the wake of the two came slowly an imperceptibility the Arab mind to study and understand the cultural and intellectual achievements of those whom they have conquered. Gradually, uh, within a century, the process of cultural contact with outside world culminated in the Arab Renaissance, centered upon Baghdad, founded by uh, Caliph Mansur in 762 AD. The center of Islamic learning was Baghdad. The reign of the early Abbasid Caliph saw an unprecedented intellectual interest in the Arab world in the region religion and sciences of the non-Muslims. Abu Jafar al-Mansur established a research and translation bureau titled Baitul Hikma, which is called House of Wisdom, where learned men engaged themselves into the study of the translation of Greek, Pahlavi, Latin, uh, Syriac, and Sanskrit works mostly on philosophical, astronomical, and medical sciences. And uh, then interest of the Arab scholars basically into the Indian science. As Sir has pointed out in the, uh, initially that, you know, the, uh, from uh, this uh, Caliph uh, period, uh, basically all the texts were translated into some from Sanskrit to Arabic. So many Arab scholars showed interest into Indian sciences. al times in the Arabia, there were circles of educated men who had an interest in getting the scientific works of Indian translated into Arabic and who were sufficiently familiar with the subject matter of various Indian texts. Even before that, at Baghdad in 8th century, many religious discussions were often held between Muslim scholars and learned men of the other communities. It is stated that under the patronage of Barmax, many pundits took part in these discussions and one or two Muslims were sent to India to acquire the knowledge of Indian sciences. See, the Barmak is basically, he was a Buddhist converted to Islam. And Barmak is, uh, you can say that it's uh, uh, Pramukh. Pramukh gets translated because there is no pay in Arabic, so it becomes Barmak. So the early references, we find that before Al-Biruni, uh, a famous scholar in Arabic language, wrote on the principles of Indian rhetoric in his work titled Kitabul Bayan. Uh, a historian and geographer who visited India compiled a list of Indian works translated into Arabic, Muhammad bin Ishaq, Ibn al-Nadim in his encyclopedic work, The al Farist refers constantly a large numbers of works on Indian religion, medicine, astronomy, etc. translated into Arabic. Qazi Sayyid Andalusi uh, has devoted one chapter on Indian science in, in his Tabqatil Umam, and uh, general biography of physicians entitled the Yunul Ibn Tibba Fi Tabakate Atibba contains one chapters of Indian physicians. And uh, I have mentioned other travelers also like Abu Dulaf Mansur Muhallal Yanubi who visited uh, Kashmir Multan Sindh. He has also written a book which is called Ajaibul Hind, but I'll skip that part. 
And now, uh, because I was talking to the medicine, Barmak, many such names have come down for us from the Al-Mansur reign when collection of works on sciences and their classification increased greatly. In the field of medicine, Indian contribution was far the greatest. An Indian Vaidya named Manka is described by Ibn al-Nadim in his al farist book uh, to have cured successfully Caliph Harun al rasid uh, on a serious disease. A Hindu physician named Ibn Dhan is mentioned as the director of the hospital of the Barmaks at Baghdad. Yahya bin Khalid Barmak not only appointed only physicians in Baghdad hospital but also engaged them to help in the translation of Sanskrit medical works into Arabic in the uh, imperial Darul Hikma. Uh, it is also said that he has sent a man to India to collect indigenous herbs. Indian medical works translated into Arabic mostly, you know, on uh, pharmacology, toxicology, translated into Arabic, but very few of them have survived uh, as of now. And uh, uh, the Sanskrit work of Aryabhatta was translated into Arabic by Al-Farazi, entitled as Arzband. Now, this uh, Ibn Mukaffa uh, part comes uh, at the end of the Caliph period, which is very, very important because uh, during the reign of Al-Mansur, Ibn Mukaffa, a thorough scholar in many languages, Indian, Greek, Pahlavi, Sanskrit, translated our masterpiece Panchtantra into Arabic, and which is known as Kalile Vadim name. Ibn Mukaffa, Arabic version of Panchtantra is perhaps the only Sanskrit work which was later on translated in about a dozen of other languages like Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Spanish, French, Turkish, and Persian. Because Panchtantra is basically is uh, called as a uh, uh, masterpiece or ambassador of Indian literature. Because nowadays more than 60 languages Panchtantra has been translated. Earlier it was translated into, first it was got translated into Arabic, then it was got translated into Pahlavi, and later on it came into Persian. So, the uh, the second phase is uh, uh, Sultanate period. The Ghaznavi that the Sultanate of Delhi as king showed very little interest in Indian literature. However, they were keen supporters of learning and culture. Towards the close of the Ghaznavid rule during the reign of Bahram Shah, Abul Mali Nasrullah, uh, who was the chief secretary in Darul Insha during the Sultan Ibrahim reign, translated the Arabic versions of Ibn Mukaffa Kalila wa Dimna into Persian. A few other works of Indian origin has survived uh, uh, era, and uh, it is recorded that Sultan Feroz Shah in 1322 AD found a temple at the Jwalamukhi where 1300 rare Sanskrit works were there. He called the pundits of the temple and selected numbers of works mostly on astronomy, music and medicine and ordered those to be translated into Persian. Among those was an Indian work on astronomy translated as Dalaile Firozi. Uh, which Badayuni claims to have read at Lahore in 1592. Another work on Indian astronomy by the great Varah Mihira was translated into Persian by the order of Sultan Firoz Shah by Shamsa Siraz Afif, the author of Tarikh-e Firoz Sahi under the title of Tarjumai Barahi. During the reign of Sikandar Lodi, a work on Indian medicine was compiled from Sanskrit sources under the supervision of Mia Bhuat, son of Khwaz Khan. This work entitled as uh, Tibbe Skandari or the Madanus Shafai Skandari was decidedly an improvement of all previous translation from the Indian works on medicine as it contained a detailed and most comprehensive account of well-versed um, uh, uh, subject uh, on the sub medicine subject. Indian music is said to have composed an original treatise on the subject called entitled Noras. Now, uh, the, now, this is the background of my uh, presentation. Now I'll to come to discuss about the Al-Buruni, how the Al-Buruni, you know, played an important role in the translation of this Sanskrit text from, uh, fr from Sanskrit to Persian. Among the Muslim travelers and historians whose individual efforts brought the knowledge of Indian sciences to the Muslim world, Abu Rehan Al-Buruni occupies a very high place. He came to India and studied at first hand Indian religious system, philosophy, literature, chronology, astronomy, customs and laws, and in return taught Islamic sciences to Indians. Al-Buruni's approach towards Indian religion and sciences is characterized by um, uh, characterized by uh, a peculiar charm of love for independent inquiry and an 
unbiased mind. In this method, he is very thorough and searching, often critical but nonetheless very sincere in the acquisition of knowledge. He has studied Indian religions, philosophy, literature, sciences and customs with a focus yield from original sources and compared them with the theories of Plato, Aristotle uh, and other Greek writers. Uh, his translation from the Sanskrit, uh, because his uh, knowledge of Sanskrit was, uh, which he has enumerated in his sources in the Kitabul Hind, seems to be enormous. His translation from Sanskrit include that of Patanjali, a treatise on the yoga and theistic philosophy developed by Patanjala, the Sankhya of Kapila, Brahma Gupta's Brahma Siddhanta on Indian astronomy, together with an original composition on the principle of Siddhanta in Arabic entitled the Jawamul Maujud Bikhwatirul Al Hunud, Varah Mihira uh, uh, Laghu Jatakam, and many other translations on Indian sciences. Uh, and another uh, but most important personality in this series whose contribution uh, in the Indo-Islamic culture is by far the greatest is Amir Khusro. During the Sultanate period, Amir Khusro stands as a, one of the leading figures whose appreciation of India and he is called as a Tutiya Hind also uh, in sciences, religions and languages was unbounded. Uh, he studied Sanskrit, wrote poetry in Braj Bhasha and attended extraordinary skill in Indian music. Uh, the Mahasirul or uh, this Mahasirul Omara details an, uh, an incident how ingeniously he outwitted the great Indian musician Gopal Naik in the court of Sultan Alauddin Khilji. Shibli Numali relates briefly Khushro's contribution to the synthesis of Indian and Persian music and shows him as the uh, inventor of many Indian Persian ragas and raginis. He is also said to have written some uh, treatise on Indian music. In one of his work, No Se Peher, uh, written in uh, 1311 AD, he lavishly praises India and gives 10 reasons for the superiority of the Indians in science and wisdom over all the nations. He examines Indian philosophy, logic, astrology, physics, mathematics, astronomy and metaphysics. About the Hindus, he, his remarks is, in divinity alone they are confused, but then so all are the other people. Though they do not believe in our religion, many of their beliefs are like us. He also speaks so many languages of India like Hindi, Sindhi, Lahori, Kashmiri, uh, uh, and uh, Gujri, Mabari, Gauri, Bengali, Avadi, and Sanskrit. Uh, if we see the Amir Khusro poetry, he is so well versed in Hindi that while writing uh, a ghazal, we all uh, have, uh, must have listened that Zehale Mishki Makun Tagaful Dorai Naina Banai Batiya. So in this uh, line, we see that half of the line written in Persian and Dorai Naina Banai Batiya is typically Hindi. Hindi. Kitabe Hizra Nadaram Aja Nale Ho Kahe Lagaye Chhatiya. So this was his skill that, you know, half line he used to write in Persian and half line he used to write in Hindi. And in another line, if we see that, Shabane Hizra Daraze Chun Zulf Varuze Vaslat Chun Umre Kuta Sakhi piya ko jo mai na dekhu, to kaise kaatu andheri ratiya. So in one line, you know, he is writing full Persian and another line he is writing Hindi. So this was his skill uh, in, uh, uh, on the Indian language. Now, uh, the contributions of the Mughal, uh, basically in third part of my presentation, I am going to discuss the contributions of the Mughal and uh, dissemination of the ancient Indian learning and cultural heritage. Uh, in this first part, there was uh, Mughal court patronage under Akbar. So during the reign of Akbar, from 1556 to 1605, uh, unprecedented official patronage of Hindu learning and translation from important Sanskrit works on Indian religion and various sciences followed. Though formerly illiterate, Akbar, like his forefathers, possessed a refined taste of learning. According to Abul Fazl, his library consisted of a large and varied collection of Hindi, Sanskrit, Persian, Greek, Kashmiri and Arabic works which were all separately class classified. Experienced people brought them daily and read them before His Majesty who heard every book from the beginning to the end. Akbar established a large translation department uh, which is called as uh, 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 large translation department whose main focus was on translating important Sanskrit works into Persian. Learned men from all the spheres of knowledge like poets, historians, theologians, theologians uh, philosophers, astronomers, physicians and musicians uh, swam the imperial court. The court chronicle records 
notices on the lives of 140 learned men in all sciences classified in five different categories, including 59 poets, court poets, and 36 principal musicians. According to Abul Fazl, uh, language experts uh, were constantly engaged in translating Sanskrit, Greek, and Persian books into other language in Akbar's translation department. Uh, in Akbar's translation department, there were three, four main important figure, which is Abul Fazl, Fazi, his brother, and Mullah Badayuni, and two, three of them are others. The most outstanding figure among the vast number of Muslim scholars and historians who engaged themselves in the translation of Sanskrit works were Akbar's scholarly Prime Minister Abul Fazl. His equally distinguished brother Fazi, a poet laureate, the eminent historian Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni, Naqib Khan, Sheikh Sultan of Thanissar, and Mullah Sheri. They were assisted in their work by an equally large number of learned pundits well versed in Indian philosophy and sciences. Uh, Sanskrit the scholars at the Mughal court were divided basically into five groups. Among the first group, those who understood the mysteries of the both the worlds, that is physical world, like Madhu Saraswati, Madhusudan, Narayan, Hariji Sur, Damodar Bhat, Ram Tirath, Narsingh, Parmindra, and Aditya. Among the second group were those who understood the mysteries of the heart, that is esoteric world, like Ram Bhadra and Jadrup. Among the third group were those who understood philosophy like Narayan, Madhu Bhatt, uh, Shri Bhatt, Vishnu Bhatt, Ram Krishna, uh, Balbhadra Mishra, Vasudeva Mishra, Baman Bhatt, Vidyanivas, Gauri Nath, Gopi Nath, Kishan Pandit, Bhattacharya, and Bhagirath Bhattacharya, and Kashinath Bhattacharya. Among the fourth group were Hindu physicians like Mahadeva, Bhim Nath, Narayan, and Shivji. Among the fifth group who were who understood sciences on the basis of testimony like Vijay Sen and Bhan Chand. Uh, I have uh, written here the split underlying the translation made for Akbar, but uh, later on we'll cover this. Now the, uh, this uh, uh, translation works generally is speaking from 1424 to 1825 AD, the period when most of the important translation of Sanskrit works were undertaken. Uh, the Indian epic, the Mahabharata ran into five different complete or abridged versions, uh, the Ramayana into six, including by two uh, Hindu translators, the Vedas one, and the Upanishads into one, Bhagavad Gita into four, and Yoga Vasista into four, including one by Hindu translator, the Panch Tantra into six, the Puranic uh, literature into 12, Singhasan Batisi into 10, and Raj Tarangani into six different versions. Other Indian works chosen by the translator and compilers were those on music, medicine, astronomy, astrology, mathematics, mythological stories and heroic legends, Puranic myths, Hindu cosmogony, comparative religion, uh, sciences, and philosophy. The quality of the translation, uh, there is no doubt that the majority of the Muslim translation had no actual knowledge of Sanskrit language and Indian philosophical terminology. But surprisingly, some of them had done remarkably accurate rendering of the Sanskrit works with this assistance of Hindu interpreters. If we compare Al-Biruni with Abul Fazl, we find that uh, in the exposition of the religious and philosophical doctrines of the Hindus, Abul Fazl stands almost alone after Al-Biruni. A genuine spirit of inquiry and love for knowledge vibrates through his detailed descriptions of Indian sciences, religious cult, and philosophical school of thought. He stands good deal of comparison uh, in many respects with Al-Biruni. Uh, both had associated with the leaders of contemporary Indian religions, thought and scholars of Sanskrit literature, and both were equally fond of comparing Hindu philosophy with Muslim doctrines. Al-Biruni's Kitabul Hind seems to be spontaneous and outspoken in criticism, unfettered by any political objective, while Abul Fazl, who wrote the Aine Akbari at Akbar's command, kept in view not only the Muslims' intelligentsia of the time, but also the fact that his readers include the Persianized Hindu court nobility. Al-Biruni, while in India, applied himself to the study of Sanskrit works in original, which made his critical mind not to accept blindly the tradition of the old. Abul Fazl, on the other hand, labored under the disadvantage of Latin knowledge of Sanskrit. He admits that he was unfamiliar with the science of terms in the Sanskrit language, and being even unable to procure the services of competent interpreter, he had to consult earlier translations. Here I cite some of the examples of the translations, particularly Sanskrit terminology into Persian by Abul Fazl, like uh, Om, he is comparing with Isme Buzurg, Upashna is comparing Farsi with Mashgul, which is totally different, not uh, 
Amrit, somehow you can say that Abhayad. Antaryami, he is saying that An ke darmiyane dil bashad was sirre dil bedanad. Any ke uh, a person who knows uh, your uh, uh, secrets. Jagrit avastha alame bedari, susupta avastha halate aram wakab, turiya halate buzurg tarin, atma jane jaha, parmatma jane buzurg. Abul Fazl's pursuit of Indian religious thought seems predominantly intellectual. According to him, there are 360 systems of Indian philosophy and conduct, and he had mixed with many leaders of thought and made himself acquainted to some extent with the discussions of different schools. His treatise on the learning of Hindus is fairly extensive and indicate that the general interest of Muslim intellectuals during the later 16th century AD. In dealing with the origin, development, and the influence of the doctrines of different schools on philosophy, like Nyaya, uh, Vaisheshka, and the Vedanta, and Mimansa, the Sankhya, the Patanjala, the Jaina, the Jain, and the Buddha, and the Nastika. The 18 sciences of the Hindus he describes among that, uh, discussed by him uh, are uh, in the Vedas, the Puranas, the Dharma Shastras, or the Institute of the Law, the uh, Shiksha or Phonetics, the Kalpa or the Science of Ceremonial Duties, the Vyakranas or the Science of Grammar and the Linguistic Analysis, or Nirupta or the Vedic Etymologies, the Jyotisha or the Astronomy, or, uh, and so on. Uh, Basically, his accounts also deals with the Indian uh, Sangeet or music, dancing and, uh, uh, the, and uh, Rajniti or the science of statecraft. Other arts and sciences of the Abul Fazl, he reviewed briefly the following arts uh, cultivated widely among the Indians. The Karm uh, Vipaka or the ripening of the actions, a science revealing the particular classes of action performed in former birth which have uh, occasion the event that befell men in the present life and prescribing the special uh, um, explanation of each sin one by one. The Samudrika or the palmistry. Uh, the third one is the Garuda or the treatment of a snake, scorpions or reptile bites by reciting and repeating the uh, genealogical descent of the victim. The Indrajala or the art of sorcery, the Rasvidya or alchemy, the Ratna Pariksha or the art of testing precious stones, Kama Shastra or the generation of the human race, the Sahitya or the art of the rhetorical composition, the Sangeet uh, or the art of the music and dance, the Gaja Shastra, the knowledge of the elephants, the uh, Salihotra, the veterinary surgery, the Vastuka, the science of architecture, the Supa, uh, the art of cookery and properties of food, the Rajniti or the science of statecraft, uh, the Vevara or the administration of justice. Uh, he translated Razumnama uh, among this important Sanskrit work uh, during the Akbar reign is the Tarjuma Mahabharata in 18 Parvas entitled as Razumnama made by the famous historian Mullah Abdul Qadir, uh, Qadir Badayuni, Abdul Lataif Al Husseini known as Naqib Khan, Muhammad Sultan Thanesheri and Mullah Sheri. The exact share of each scholar in this translation of the great Indian epic into Persian cannot however, be estimated. Badayuni, however, gives some more vivid details of the history of the translation. According to him, the two nights Akbar himself translated some passages into Persian and told Naqib Khan to write down the general meaning. It is, however, odd that in the uh, colophon of one of the manuscripts of the work in the Indian office, it is distinctly stated that Naqib Khan was the original translator who completed his task in one and a half year in 1584 AD with the help of a Brahman scholar like uh, Devi Mishra, Satvadan, Madhusudan Mishra, and Chaturbhuja uh, and Bhavan. Abul Fazl wrote a preface to the work and his brother Fazi, a few years later in 1589 AD, retranslated the literal version into ornamental and highly ornamental prose. Now, Mullah Abdul Qadir Banai, he is the second important figure during this uh, Mughal period. Uh, Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni seems to be the principal translator of Sanskrit works on Hindu religion at the Emperor Akbar's court. And a genius as a historian, his profound scholarship both in Arabic and Persian, his proficiency in Islamic theology, his knowledge of astrology, astronomy and mathematics, and his extraordinary skill both in Indian and foreign music 
outweighed his innate prejudice against the Sheikh brothers. Though the emperor found him a staunch Muslim, he was highly pleased with his translation and would not part with him on that account. Badayuni has given an excellent picture of the work of the translation carried out uh, on at the instance of Akbar. Uh, the Persian translation of Ramayana, uh, which was done by Badayuni, uh, has big, uh, in the year 1584 and completed in uh, four years' time in 1588 uh, AD. He was reluctant to write a preface to the translation, but the emperor's command, he found no way out but to comply. Besides Badayuni translation, there are at least four other abridged uh, Persian versions of Ramayana extant. Uh, the first is an abridged prose translation of uh, um, Sandaraman Kaist bin Sri Hariram, uh, Sri Ram, uh, made by Alamgir Sren in 1686 AD. There are two supplements of this version of Ramayana. One is sort of appendix to the Ramayana described to the authorship of Valmiki, dated June 1696. And the second one is a legend of uh, Sri Krishna due to uh, Vyasa from the Mahabharata. The second is entitled as the Masnavi Ramayana, an abridged Persian version in 5,900 Masnavi verses by Giridhar Das Kaist, completed in 1624 AD and dedicated to Emperor Jahangir. The third is another abridged poetical translation of Ramayana entitled Ram o Sita by Sheikh Sadullah Masih of Panipati, uh, Panipat, a contemporary of Giridhar Das. This translation was also completed in Jahangir Sen, who is praised in this work. The fourth is a very large, though incomplete, poetical translation of Ramayana by anonymous writer. Uh, after translating the Ramayana, Badayuni embarks on the translation of Athar Veda. In this context, he says that in the year 16, uh, 1575 AD, a learned Brahman who had embraced Islam and took the name of Sheikh Bhavan came from Deccan. The emperor commanded Badayuni to the same year to uh, translate the uh, Athar Veda. While translating the work, he found several of the religious percepts of this book resembles the law of Islam. But there were many difficult passages uh, which hampered his task of the interpretation. He referred these passages to Sheikh Bhavan, who also could not interpret either. Badayuni reported the master to his majesty, who ordered Sheikh Fazi and Haji Ibrahim to translate. Haji Ibrahim, though willing, did not write anything. Uh, any other translation of the Athar Veda so far not known, uh, uh, and it does not exist. Now, uh, one uh, another important book, Sihasan Batisi, which Abdul Qadir Badani translated, uh, uh, or it, uh, translate, it's, another name is Vikram Vikrama Charitram, uh, or Sihasan Batisi. In Farsi, it is called Khrid Afza made at the order of Akbar with the help of the learned Brahman in the year of 1574 AD is perhaps the oldest translation from the original Sanskrit. Another rendering of the same work likewise composed under Akbar's order by one Chaturbhuj Das bin Meher Chand Kaist under the title of the Shahnama. Many other Persian translations of the Singhasan Batisi, though under different names, are still extant. During Emperor Jahangir's reign uh, in uh, 1610 AD, one Bharimal bin Rajmal Khatri translated it under the name of Singhasan Batisi entitled Kissai Bikramjit. Another translation under the title of Kishan Bilas, who made uh, by Kishan Das bin Mulukchan, probably during the Jahangir reign. A combination of the two older versions of Chaturbhuj Das and Bharimal was made during the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan by Bisbari bin uh, Hari Garbdas. There are four other different versions of this work. And uh, another important work of uh, Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni is Raj Tarangini. According to Badayuni, the Raj Tarangini has already been translated at the order of Sultan Zainul Abedin Shah of Kashmir uh, in uh, 1470 AD. This version entitled as Baharul Asmar was incomplete and written in Pahlavi language. At first, Badaini was asked by the emperor to complete the work by translating two of the remaining chapters left out by the author of the Baharul Asmar. One night after he had listened to some chapters to the work, Akbar ordered him to retranslate uh, the earlier portion also in plain language. Uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Fazi, uh, now I'll discuss about Fazi uh, and his translation from Sanskrit. The poet laureate of the Akbar's court, Fazi, a man of 
versatility and all-round accomplishment uh, was in constant association with the court translator. His poetical genius found his material of rare romantic charm from the pages of the Indian epic, the Mahabharata. In uh, gracefulness of the thought and beauty of expression, his 4,200 verse Masnavi, the Nalwadaman, uh, a free Persian adaptation of the story of Nalwadamanti, composed in 1595 AD in short span of five months, still remains a work of great style and diction. According to Badayuni, when it was presented to Akbar formally, it was included among the set of books read at the court, and Naqib Khan was the appointed to read it to His Majesty, the poetical merits of Nalwadaman have been appealed to Badayuni, and Badayuni says that it is indeed a Masnavi like those of Amir Khusro of Delhi. And uh, Fazi interest in the Sanskrit literature, uh, basically he prosaic version, he translated Mahavarta in uh, uh, prose version also. Uh, and he has written one important book which is called Sharikul Marifat with his uh, son of uh, uh, Gnosticism, uh, a treatise on the Vedanta philosophy based entirely on Sanskrit sources, mostly on Yog Vasist and the Bhagavad Purana. It is divided into the 12 uh, Lamat, which is chapter. The first Lama deal with the greatness of Lord Krishna and the description of uh, the application of the yogic practices. The second Lama gives the description that the all worldly lights, Nure Alam, uh, Nurhaye Alam resembles darkness before that illuminated one embracing the all lights, which is called Manavari Muhite Hame Nurha As. The third Lama deals with the essence of human body, Darbayane Mahiyate Kalbe Insan. The fourth Lama deals with the condition of a uh, disciple, which is called Murid in Farsi, who sets out on the path of yoga. And the fifth Lama gives the description of the essence of the God uh, uh, and the essence of his attributes. The sixth Lama deals with the knowledge of absolute essence. The seventh Lama gives a description of and attributes of the absolute essence. It also deals with some yogic practices. The eighth Lama deals with the quality of human structure, which is qualified as alam e sagir the ninth lama gives the description that the seeker ultimately becomes initiated uh, into the mystery of the self the tenth lama deals with the renunciation of the desires and also of the growth of the attachment and also of the action and their outcome so that perfect detachment might be acquired the eleventh lama is on the description of the whatever is action is perishable and that the body itself is the result of action and has emanated out of action and that the soul which is agent is imperishable and eternal. The twelfth lama is on the description of uh, the worshipper of the real God in certainly, uh, real God in certainly reaches perfection. Now uh, I have written uh, the translation of Puranas and other religious works. I don't know how much time is there for me sir. No, no, you have time. Okay. Of the large number of works on Indian religion and sciences written on translated by Muslims, few can however be mentioned in this presentation. The translation of the Puranic literature including that of Haribansh Purana by anonymous author, the Bhagavad Purana by Tahir bin Imad in uh, 602 AD at the instance of Akbar, the Mahavishnu Purana containing dialogues between uh, Parasara and Maitri, the Vishnu Purana, uh, Shiv Purana and Skanda Purana entitled Chitra Mahatam and the uh, Purantha Prakash among other works are uh, the Persian translation of the Amrit Kunda on the religious and philosophical doctrines of the Hindus like Baharul Hayat by Muhammad Gawalieri. This work had already been translated into Arabic during Sultan Alauddin uh, reign by a newly converted Brahman named Karanam. A Persian translation of the Hitopadesha was made by Tajuddin Ziauddin Ali Rasai, uh, compiled a code of Hindu laws from the original Sanskrit source. A full account of these creeds, traditions and sects of the Hindus and Muslims of India by Muhammad Hassan Qatil in his work Haf Tamasha and a Persian translation of Sanskrit poetical work on Islamic theology and science style by Khub Tarang compiled by Sheikh Kamaluddin, Sheikh Kamal Muhammad in uh, 1676 AD. Among other notable translations that uh, of the Bhaskar Acharya Sanskrit treatise on algebra and mensuration, the Bij Ganita by Ataullah Rashidi in 1634 AD, and Mukammal Khan Gujarati's translation of Tajak 
and astronomical work into Persian. The most important work on Indian system on, of medicine was compiled by Muhammad Qasim Farishta entitled Dasturul Atibba. And a uh, few works on the music which I have mentioned here. Uh, that is uh, basically uh, Abul Fazl remarks that distinguished Indian musicians at the Mughal court, including Mirza Tansen, uh, in 1500, died in 1589 AD. He says that the musicians like whom has not appeared in the last thousand years. Both Akbar and Shah Jahan were great lovers of music, and at the order of Shah Jahan, all genuine Drupads of the famous Indian musician uh, uh, Bhakswa Gwaleri were collected in the work entitled called Raghaye Hindi in 1665 AD. Fakirullah translated Indian musical modes and melodies from the original Sanskrit work, the Rag Darpan into Persian. During Alamgir's reign, the translation of the Sanskrit work on Indian music entitled uh, Tarjumaya Prajakta was made by Mirza Roshan Damir. A tract known as the Rag Mala on Indian Ragas and Raginis uh, written in uh, 1774 AD and a collection of Indian Raginis in Rekhta, Braj, Punjabi and Persian made a little letter. Three other works written in the 18th century deserve mention over here. The Kanze Mushiki, a repertory of Indian music, Hindi Doras mixed with Persian verses. Uh, Samsul Aswat, a treatise on Indian music compiled in 1697 AD and the Mufarihul Kulub by Hassan Ali Izzat of Deccan at the order of Tipu Sultan in uh, 1799 uh, AD. During the reign of Alamgir, Mirza Fakhruddin Muhammad made a serious attempt at the scientific presentation of Indian arts in his encyclopedic work. The Tofatul Hind, written at the order of uh, Kukultash Khan for the emperor's son Mirza Prince Muizuddin Jahandar Shah. It deals with the Indian system of writing, the principle of uh, orthography, prosody, rhyme, rhetoric, love and lovers, uh, uh, music, science of uh, sexual enjoyment, uh, and Indo-Persian lexicon and terminology. Now in the last leg of the presentation, uh, I'm going to discuss about the Dara Shikoh contribution to the propagation of Indian age old learnings, cultural heritage, and his philosophy. Uh, in the 16, 140 or, and 1650, the Mughal prince Dara Shiko sponsored a series of Sanskrit and Persian translation owing to his particular interest in the Hinduism and Indian philosophy. Two things are clear from the study of his works on Hinduism and his translation from Sanskrit. His pursuit of the Indian religious thought was intuitive with his spiritual background. It was neither academic nor intellectual nor as a something it had any political motive. As he himself observed, it was a part of his desire for investigation of the truth. Secondly, its comparative value was confined, unlike Badayuni and Abul Fazl, to Islamic thought only, mostly in the details of the technical terms and not of any major speculative problems. Thus, in the first place, we find that his word-for-word -word translation of the Upanishad was made for his own spiritual benefit and for the religious advancements of his children, friends, and seekers of the truth. Similarly, he remarks in the Majmul Bahrain that his researches in comparative study were according to his own intuition and taste, for the benefit of the members of his family and that he had no concern with the common folk or either community. He does not find incongruity of the truth in Hinduism and the Vedas appear to him as the essence of monotheism. He thinks that the monotheistic philosophy of Upanishad is in conformity with the Holy Quran and a commentary thereon. And he comes to the conclusion that the verses of the Holy Quran are literally found in Upanishads. His works on Hinduism and translation from Sanskrit. Uh, Dara Shiko translation from Sanskrit include that of Upanishad, uh, called as Surya Akbar, the Bhagavad Gita, and the translation of Yoga Vasist, made at his instance. His other works on the Hinduism are Majmul Bahrain, a comparative study on Hinduism and Islam, and uh, the Mukalma, uh, or Seven Dialogue on the Comparative Mythology, with a Hindu saint called, uh, named as Baba Lal Das. The Risalai Haknuma, though a treatise on Sufi practices, shows distinct sign of the influence of the Indian yoga philosophy. Dara Shiko claimed that he had read a Persian translation of Yoga Vasist by Sheikh Sufi, probably by uh, Sharif uh, Kubzani, entitled the 
tufaye majlis based on the yoga vasis shastra prior to uh, prior to 1658 ad when he ordered a retranslation of this work some of the physical exercise detail in risala that uh, uh, habse dam or aurude burd the astral healing the centers of meditation in the heart and brain etc bear a close resemblance in the hindu tantric meditation the salik's journey through the four words four worlds of nasu nasut jabrut malkut and lahut for instance is compared by him to the indian uh, avasthaman or the four words of jagrat swapna susupti and turiya the majmul bahran written in 1655 ad prior to the translation of upanishad shows clearly that by that time dara shiko has acquired considerable knowledge of hindu yogic and vedantic philosophy together sanskrit technical vocabulary of indian mythology and cosmology etc which would enable enable him to make a comparative study of the same with their equivalents from islamic thought thus we find that he has dealt with the identical conceptions of elements senses devotional exercises soul air sound vision of god skies earth resurrection etc and both uh, in both the religions the mukalma baba lal das wo dara shiko shows the same comparative spirit and his knowledge of indian mythology and some aspects of his speculative philosophy of the hindus uh, his knowledge of sanskrit uh, uh, not withstanding the fact that he employed a large number of sanskrit pandit in the translation of the upanishad appears to very considerable his intimate knowledge of hinduism may be the result of that interaction with them in the preface of sri akbar he observes that the city of banaras uh, is the center of sciences of the hindus community was in certain relation with him from the chronicles of the mughal period we come to know that at delhi imperial court many eminent sanskrit scholars were employed and maintained by emperors akbar jahangir and shah jahan the following sanskrit scholars were associated with dara shiko like pancharaja phatan mishra harnath kavindracharya saraswati and uh vamsidha mishra other sanskrit scholars who were directly in the pay role of the prince darashiko included banwali das a munshi of darashiko who was bilingual scholar in the persian and sanskrit and remained in the service of the prince for a long time uh, the another important uh, jagannath mishra the eminent sanskrit poet and the scholar on whom shah jahan bestowed the title of pandit raja he was attached to the court of darashiko who was a great admirer of his poetry and chandrabhan brahman another munshi of darashiko who translated for him the mukalma mukalmae baba lal das into persian and uh, the last kavindracharya saraswati of banaras whose connection with the mughal court and his great influence with shah jahan and darashiko is established from the sanskrit uh, anthology kavindra chandrodaya so these were the people who were associated with uh, darashiko uh while translating the uh, upanishad <coughs> and uh, other uh, yoga vasistha now i'll come to the conclusion part that uh, in concluding remarks this uh, incorporation of the sanskrit text in the persianate world uh, reach its acme during the mughal period especially during the life of darashiko mughals promoted persian as a language of culture and administration members of the ruling uh, elite also aggressively formed ties with sanskrit literary and engaged with sanskrit text in terms of literary impacts mongol engagement with sanskrit significantly affected the sanskrit and indo persian thought world both of which underwent massive changes both traditions interacted with each others ideas idioms and stories on unprecedented level during the mogul period uh, these dialogues across linguistic boundaries helped uh, to solidify exchange between different traditions as a prevailing mode of cultural growth the mughals cultivated multicultural and multilingual imperial image that involved uh, repeated attention to the sanskrit texts intellectuals and the knowledge system communities outside the ruling elite responded to this self fashioning in many ways and their reactions no doubt encouraged the mughals to continue these dynamic encounters the mughal kings mobilized their encounters with sanskrit texts in order to promote a vision of a strong authority and of multifaceted political interests thank you very much <laughs> i take this opportunity to thank everyone present here and uh, let me invite everyone 
for a cup of tea outside the hall. 